Good. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, so this is our third Lunch and Learn uh, event. Um, uh, I'm Christopher Bowker. I'm a rate payer out of Gladstone, and I sit on the West Advisory Committee. And um, I'll be facilitating this event with the help of Chris Kuntz, who's in the background um, uh, as, as we go through this. This is the second of a two-part series that has been focusing on emerging contaminants and regulations. The first part was last fall, and that really focused on emerging contaminants. And then today we're going to be focusing on regulations, the world of regulations presented by Ron Weyernga. Um, and I did want to do a quick little plug. So this is the third of the four that we had originally planned for. So we only have one left that's planned uh, this fall. And the, the tentative topic for that is the emergency response and resilience. So um, especially as, as we're going through today and as you think about this moving forward, if you've got suggestions for new topics, um, I think we'd be very interested for uh, starting in 2025 for how we could maybe um, have future sessions on whatever those future topics of interest are to the West Advisory Committee, to West staff. Um, uh, just please, please let us know. Um, Oh, let's see. Um, I think for this, it is going to be a long presentation. So I just wanted to stress, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, but otherwise, I think we're good to go. Um, anything else, Chris, that I need to... I think that covers our bases, right? I think that covers the bases. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll just round them all up at the end um, and go through them if uh, that's helpful, but I think we're, we're ready. Yeah, very good. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Ron. Great, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? And I will share. And just confirm you can see the slide. Perfect. So yeah, um, again, Ron Waringa, I'm the Deputy Director of WES. Um, you know, Chris and I were talking, I'll, I'll lead with this with Chris and I, Christopher and I and Chris were talking in prep for this. And we were talking about the value of these lunch and learns and not only what they mean, you know, for us and an opportunity to engage our advisory committee uh, more deeply on some special topics, also our staff, but they also have mileage as well. We've used previous lunch and learns. Um, in some of our day to day work, I can give you an example. Someone reached out to me a few months ago and said, you know, they're a little, they, they said, hey, do you know about PFAS? What do you know about PFAS? And what are you doing about PFAS? And I sent them the lunch and learn link that we had in the video. And I said, watch this and then let's meet. And then they got back to me and said, no, we're good. You guys are on top of it. Uh, and, you know, it was really useful in that way. And so uh, we're excited to do these. They're useful for us as an organization and, and they do get used. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, this one is... Uh, is is a presentation on overall um, regulatory affairs, what that means for us as an organization um, and how it impacts us going into the future. I wanna note really before we get started that this this is really a career. Regulatory affairs is a, is a really big topic. It includes regulatory management, regulatory compliance at the day-to-day -day level, regulatory policy, advocacy, all those things. Uh, we can't cover everything you need to know about uh, Wes's regulatory work. Um, and, and it's not something I think that you'll find on our org chart. We don't have a regulatory affairs program. We have a distributed responsibility throughout our organization. Primarily the responsibility falls under our deputy director position to manage Wes's overarching regulatory affairs. We're fortunate in that we have Greg Geist as a director who was a, a former DEQ official and is an expert um, in the area and knows a lot of people at DEQ. So we're, I think West has a leg up in that regard. Um, but we have about two, a little over two FTE that are dedicated to our regulatory uh, affairs work. And then we rely heavily on subject matter experts from throughout the organization to engage in particular activities. We draw from staff in our operations division, our engineering division, and our environmental services division. And that is, it's really a regulatory affairs team um, within the organization. So it takes a village. Um, and like I said, there's a lot to learn. Uh, so let's get started. This is what we're going to cover 
today did the slide advance i want to make sure i think i forgot to advance slides last time so good start um we're talking about really environmental regulations today i mean clearly and as you all know we have um, employment laws there that we need to comply with there's osha requirements there's financial requirements we have a lot of laws that uh, regulate our work um, we're focusing on the environmental uh, laws today. And we're really going to just sort of drill down into water. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the world of regulations being land, air, and water, sort of mimicking the way DEQ lays out their organization. We'll talk a little bit about our compliance with laws that apply to land and those that apply to air. And then we'll drill down in, into water, do a little bit of, a, of some background on the Clean Water Act and kind of dive into what our wastewater and stormwater permits look like and what that means to us as an organization and how they influence our work. And then we'll finish with really, um, what are we what are we looking out on the horizon uh, to see what's coming our way and how are we trying to actively manage that? So hopefully we'll get there. I do hope I answer the question somewhere about existing and designated uses. Now that I'm thinking about it, Jeff, I might not. So we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> but I wanna note uh, as we start really, uh, our, our regulatory, the world of regulations for us goes goes beyond the Clean Water Act. It it really is something that affects us probably most significantly day to day. But there are other regulations at the federal level um, that do influence our work from the Drinking Water Act, uh, Safe Drinking Water, Clean Air Act, and others that are on the screen, Superfund, uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, which, which governs some of our solid waste disposal and hazardous materials uh, activities. Um, there's a lot at the federal level for us to to um, look at, and then the uh, the majority of these federal laws are are promulgated through DEQ. But it is a pretty a pretty vast world, not just the Clean Water Act, which I don't know that a lot of people know. We're going to start with land and and be somewhat brief here. I just want to give people the sense and the understanding that we there are there are in Oregon laws around land quality uh, that pertain to us. One is um, the areas of landfill permits, so we do landfill, uh, a lot of the waste that the solid waste that comes to our treatment plants. And if you've taken tours of the treatment plants, you know, we get solid waste and things that we need to dispose of, um, occasionally dispose of um, uh, like media from the treatment plants, spent media that's no longer of use that uh, and, and grit that comes out of the grit chambers and some of the some of the early settling and screening areas. So we certainly throw a lot of stuff away. Um, and we have we have to get uh, permits from the landfills that we use to ensure that what we're dis that what, what we're disposing of is not qualify as hazardous materials, and we need to comply with those permits. So that's something that Terrence does in our environmental services division. Um, so that is certainly something we keep an eye on. We also have um, contaminated sites. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people know that um, the, the we have a we have a landfill. It's on the Tri City. Uh, facility property, the old Rossman landfill, which was an unpermitted dump operated in the 60s and then later used as a gravel mine in the 70s and 80s, 80s including, including um, solids disposal there uh, when in an attempt to reclamate, to reclaim the mine. Um, and there have been hazardous uh, materials detected in that area and the soil and the groundwater. And we are uh, responsible for complying with our prospective purchaser agreement that when we acquired the property, uh, we negotiated with DEQ that really provides us some relief of future liability from cleanup and impacts um, from that contamination if we follow uh, a DEQ approved work plan and then work towards returning that land um, to productive use for our treatment works um, at the Tri-City facility as required. Um, that the work in that uh, contaminated site cleanup is governed by um, Oregon laws, both ORS 465 on hazardous materials, as well as ORS 459, uh, the section 459, which um, is solid waste management as applicable in the rec in, in that contaminated site cleanup. But that is another area where we are responsible for compliance with laws at uh, uh, when it comes to land. Uh, the, the last thing I want to kind of note about land, just planting seeds here, we can always talk about this stuff later as well as if people are interested. Um, it, the, the land quality laws don't necessarily apply to our land application of um, biosolids, uh, which some of the laws, the solid waste laws refer to as sewage sludge. Um, but 
um, it is it's it's kind of an all or nothing in in the in Oregon law and Oregon rule that um, it, I'll just read it to you real quick. It says any person engaged in domestic wastewater collection or treatment processes where domestic wastewater treatment facilities, solids, biosolids, derived products, or domestic septage or um, land applied or disposed must have in possession a valid NPDES permit or WPCF permit. We'll talk about what those are. Let's just say permit, um, or you have to comply with the solid waste, or you have to obtain a solid waste disposal permit. And so uh, the, the important note here is because we our biosolids management activities and land application are covered under our NPDES wastewater permit for our facilities, we do not have to have a solid waste disposal and the land uh, the, the land quality laws in the state of Oregon don't apply. Hey, Ron. Yep. Maybe a quick question. I don't mean to derail you too much. So there, there was a question, and, and I think it might help with the, the understanding and the clarity throughout the presentation. Could you just quickly explain what, what you mean by the term media? Just so people can um, follow you. Yeah. The term. yeah. Uh, so so let me get, and an example would be a, a, a media that is in some of our odor control facilities that's used to help us control odors um, at some point will needs to be uh, refreshed and so that media is replaced um, and the old media is disposed of. I'm sure Jeff and probably Terrence could give other examples of of media that's used in the process that needs to be thrown away at some point. Okay. Uh, I, I think that helps clarify that a bit. Thank you. Okay. Um, so air, the next stop in the world of our regulations, we certainly do need to comply with um, air quality uh, requirements. Um, any facility in the state that emits air pollution above certain levels are required to have air quality permits. Those permits are called air contaminant discharge permits. Um, those permits specify uh, how we, what equipment we need to have, not, not specifically what equipment we need to have, but we need to have equipment to control air pollution and we have to operate that equipment in an appropriate way. Um, the permits will specify what pollutant limits, um, so emission standards for certain things uh, that we need to meet. Um, and the permits also specify what records we need to keep and what we need to submit to DEQ and operation of, of any equipment that we have uh, that might emit air pollution. Those permits can be simple, general, or, or standard permits covering mainly the operation for us of engine sources. Um, so like fixed generators or standby generators we have at our facilities. Um, our digester gas uh, cogen engine is is an example of equipment that is a source of, of air pollution um, and our boilers, for example. So our permits will specify at each of our facilities what equipment we have that is, that is considered a source. Our flare, for example, um, at Tri-City is another example. Um, and, and those permits do uh, for some of those sources have specific emission standards for things like particulate matter, um, nitrous oxides and carbon monoxide, for example. So we have to do some source testing over time and we have to um, do continual monitoring and reporting to DEQ on how we're complying with those permits. Um, I'll note too that the, those permits do cover other non-numeric type of uh, requirements or have other non-numeric requirements, like things like um, any sort of vis visible pollution or pollution uh, that's emitted that might uh, impact um, that environment, fugitive emissions, um, particular matter and odors, particularly that, and I, I found this interesting because it was a question that I had, I had wondered um, what, you know, are odors covered by air permits? And they certainly are. It says, it says we're not allowed to, cause or allow our the emission of odorous or other fugitive emissions um, so as to create nuisance conditions off the permittee's property. And so um, that those those types of complaints need to be verified by DEQ um, and they can hold us to uh, um, fixing those or addressing those issues under these permits as well. Um, the, another area outside uh, in the air quality arena outside of our permits is Cleaner Air Oregon. Um, some laws that were passed relatively recently that have that rank, generally are addressing um, issues about toxic air 
emissions. So in 2016, DEQ began um, requiring facilities with um, air contaminant discharge permits to do an analysis of toxic emissions and, and do an inventory of toxic emissions every couple of years um, and submit those to DEQ. So we are, are actively engaged in that as well and in, in fulfilling our obligations under Clean Air Oregon um, in that arena. And another step of Clean Air Oregon, if you have a facility that is considered to be uh, a potential significant source of air pollution, you go on a list and then DEQ brings you into the Clean Air Oregon program over time. And, and our Tri-City facility is on that list. Um, and so at some point in the future, we'll be pulled into the program and we'll need to do a risk assessment uh, for air emissions from, from that facility as well. So there are certainly areas in the, in the, in the under air quality where, where we have to um, comply with those, those laws. But water quality is is a big driver for us, obviously, in sort of the the, the third leg of the stool in the world of regulations. Um, water quality requirements and whether they're law by law or rule or both, um, are generally come from the federal government, from the EPA, and in and and in Oregon, are those rules are those rules are promulgated by DEQ. They have the authority; they're a permitting authority in the state. Um, our state's rules generally mirror the federal requirements. States certainly have the option and the opportunity to have more, have requirements that are more stringent than the federal government. Oregon's rules are pretty straightforward and, and generally mirror the federal government. So that makes things a little easy, easier for us. The three main areas um, when it comes to permitting under water quality are the, are the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination um, program or NPDES program, and we have uh, the majority of our wastewater facilities are covered under NPDES permits, as well as our municipal, our municipal stormwater permit is an NPDES permit as well. Um, we have water pollution control facilities permits. We'll talk a little bit about that um, for discharges to non-navigable water, including groundwater. Um, and then the total maximum daily load program is an important part of, of the federal and state regulatory construct. So let's talk a little bit about um, the Clean Water Act. It, we, we've talked about this in the past. It's been the subject of several quiz questions, um, but uh, the, the initial Clean Water Act was passed in, in under a different name and in 1972, directing EPA to implement these programs that are listed on the screen around water quality standards, issue permits that control the discharge of pollution, um, and then the the, uh, the first part of the of the Clean Water Act was uh, the um, authorization of funding for constructing treatment plants. Back in the day, um, there were the 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 act was amended um, a few times in 1977. Amended to include certain agricultural exemptions to the 404 program, or that's the wetland or water uh, the wetland fill uh, and impacts the wetland program. 1981 um, was. Uh, amendments to streamline the construction grants process. Um, and in 1987, there were amendments that uh, generally phased out the construction grants program as the federal money dried up and um, replaced it with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And also very importantly for stormwater, when we talk about it, um, the 1970 amendments included uh, non-point sources in point source permitting. <laughs> and we'll get into that uh, in a little bit, it includes it included stormwater runoff um, in the NPDES program and 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 discharges from municipal systems as needing um, permits. So that was significant as well. Um, the the statutory purpose of the Clean Water Act really is to maintain um, chemical, physical, and biological the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters. The two primary goals were eliminating pollution to the extent that we could. And that's where the fishable swimmable um, goal came from as well. Uh, in, in the law itself or the statutory elements, it establishes jurisdiction over discharges to particular waterways, which is never very clear and continues to be um, uh, a, a source of, of discussion, I guess, in the courts today. Um, another The other elements were that um, you could not discharge pollution to surface waters. Uh, 
without permits, uh, permits for certain discharges. But even if you don't have permits, there's still the law still applies to discharges to surface water. Um, if there are permits, that there need to be limits uh, that control those those authorized discharges in your permits. Um, whether there would be federal or state implementation of the Clean Water Act is another important part of the of the statute. Whether you're in a state like Oregon that is delegated, or another state that um, or on tribal land where EPA is the implementer, um, requirements for spill response reporting and prevention. Uh, Permits for dredge and fill materials, like we said, under 404, and then enforcement. These are all, if you if you read the Clean Water Act and you look at those sections, those are going to be uh, the general requirements of the act. So let's dive into wastewater um, a little more, and uh, particularly our, our National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits for our treatment facilities. Um, some of the statutory highlights for our POTWs, and that stands for publicly owned treatment works. It's a Clean Water Act term. Um, we use treatment plants. We use water resource recovery facilities. Um, you use several terms. The Clean Water Act calls them publicly owned treatment works, so we'll call them that. Uh, there are various sections that are, are relevant to us and where we do um, quite a bit of work uh, defining what a treatment work is and making sure it's applicable to our facilities setting the secondary treatment requirements, and we'll get into that in a second, um, and to what level do we need to treat waste before we discharge it to the waters of the U.S. Um, requirements under Section 402 is where we find all of our stormwater permitting requirements, and um, and then again, uh, combined sewer overflows, which is not as relevant in our area um, as in other parts of the country, but is a significant source of, of um, requirements for our nation's wastewater treatment system. A big part of that is effluent limits. So we said, you know, the Clean Water Act says you have to have a permit. You need to be authorized to discharge pollutants to the waters of the U.S. and those permits need to have limits on what you can discharge. Um, and the Clean Water Act um, generally says pollutant discharges to surface waters are prohibited if you're not complying with a permit and those permit needs to, uh, there, are two, there are two important um, standards in those permits that we need to understand in, in order to, to cover what permitting looks like, and that's the technology-based effluent limits and water quality-based effluent limits that we find in our permits. Um, the technology-based effluent limits are, are applied consistently throughout the country and are typically derived from the EPA. Um, or promulgated by the EPA and, and federal requirements. And they say, they, they will say specifically what number or what performance a facility needs to attain in, in reducing things like BOD, biological oxygen de demand, or um, suspended solids, total suspended solids, or pH. This is something that they say, doesn't matter what water body you're discharging to, doesn't matter where you are in the country, these are the, the federal standards that are, that that we think you can meet based on um, best available technology. And so we have those uh, in some of our, our permits as well. It, it, as it says on the slide, those show up as what are called secondary treatment standards, which are part of the Clean Water Act. Um, they also apply to, uh, separately from things like BOD and TSS, there are uh, technical Technology-based effluent limits applied to industrial wastewater dischargers, whether you discharge directly to a surface water or to a system like Wes owns. Um, there are categorical limits for certain users that apply to industrial wastewater discharges. And again, it doesn't matter what your system is or where you are. These are the limits that you need to meet. Um, and an important part of the technology-based effluent limits um, is that backsliding is prohibited. And so the anti-backsliding provision uh, in permits is is really important to understand. It basically means you never go backwards. So DE, they're in very except for in very limited circumstances, neither the EPA or the DEQ can give you a permit that is less stringent than the permit that you currently have for a technology based effluent limit. They can't make it higher. Again, there are some some off ramps, but for the most part, uh, backsliding is not allowed. So you have to be really careful about what limits you accept in a permit, um, they're very hard to undo. Water quality-based effluent limits are different from technology-based effluent limits in that they are really set for 
particular water bodies and more regionalized or localized water quality goals. And so water quality based effluent limits are almost always lower than a technically a technology based effluent limit. And they are really designed to help um, a particular water body attain the water quality that it needs to support beneficial uses. Um, that's true for even the secondary treatment standards that we talked about on the previous slide for like biological oxygen demand or total suspended solids where um, DEQ has done a total, total maximum daily load and has determined how much pollution or a pollutant load that those water bodies can receive and still meet um, still meet the designated uses of the water body. In Oregon, and particularly in the Willamette Basin, where our largest wastewater treatment plants discharge, we have water, DEQ applies water quality-based effluent limits to our, our permits, um, not the federal technology-based effluent limits. So our, our, our allowable levels of discharge of solids and BOD, for example, are much, much lower in the Willamette Basin than they are at the federal level much lower. And so that's what shows up in our permit and that shows up where they come from. You really have to have uh, a water quality assessment to assess impairments and the state in order to apply water quality based effluent limits has to have a TMDL. So in the absence of determining what that pollutant load is for a water body, a, a state can't um, set a water quality based limit and a permit uh, without that analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, TMDLs in a minute. Uh, those pollutant loads that are that come from uh, the the total maximum daily loads show up in our permits both as concentrations as in water quality based effluent limits as well as mass load limits at times. So not only is there a concentration of solids that we need to stay below in our permit, but there's also a mass load like the pounds a day um, or thousands of pounds a day that we can discharge that show up as waste load allocations in our permits. So TMDLs are really important for this, this alternate type of um, permit limit that you'll see in permits. And then there are some relief mechanisms, some off ramps um, if you it, to, to meeting in some, in some circumstances, these effluent limits, no matter how they're derived. Um, in, in some situations, it just, it just doesn't work, um, or it just might not work when those limits are applied. And so some of those um, relief mechanisms like for or, or, or use of standards that are solely applied during wet weather that allow people to discharge higher levels of solids or BOD um, during wet weather events. We don't have those here. There are none in Oregon. Um, it's actually a, very, a pretty challenging off-ramp to get down. Um, but it is possible uh, to do that. It's been done elsewhere in the country. Um, compliance schedules are something are, are an off ramp for if you have new limits show up in your permit and you don't have the treatment works to be able to meet those limits um, right off the bat. Then, um, then you can develop a compliance schedule that allows you to meet those over time. Primarily used for water quality based effluent limits. We have those in our permits. Integrated planning um, allows you to kind of space that get the construction of those treatment works over time, buys you a little more time or variances as options as well, saying we can't meet that limit and here's why. It's a pretty site specific explanation. Um, those can be done at the individual level or even statewide, a variance for something like mercury, which is very difficult to meet. So I want to walk through a little bit what some of our uh what what are in our wastewater permits. Um so, so you can see kind of what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The permits are really uh, structured by schedules. So when you open one up and you get past all the facility information, the first section you'll come to is Schedule A, which really talks about what waste discharge permits you have in your permit. So I provide a little background on where they come from. Um, it's the Schedule A in all of our permits where you will, you will read what effluent limits we have, is there a mixing zone? Does a mixing zone apply? And what are the limits in the mixing zone? And that's where we also get into recycled water, biosolids, chlorine usage, and things like um, mercury minimization plans. Those all show up in Schedule A of our permits. Schedule B is all about monitoring and reporting. We, we the, the world we live in, the regulatory world we live in, um, is really a, a monitoring and self-reporting world. Um, our compliance 
uh, with those permits is really demonstrated by the, the, the data that we come up with and what we report to DEQ. DEQ occasionally shows up to do an inspection and we'll do some additional sampling, but for the most part, um, it's sort of an honor system. And that's really important for, for our agency and our field for clean water agencies. There's extensive monitoring and reporting in our permits. Schedule B in our permit is very long. Um, and as you can see from the requirements on the slide, we monitor our influent, effluent, our receiving waters, we in, our, our industries that discharge to us. We have to routinely screen for effluents, um, effluent toxics, as well as whole effluent toxicity, which is a biological test. Um, and, if, and if you have recycled water or biosolids, there's extensive testing requirements in those as well. So we spend a lot of time and effort and resources on monitoring. I had mentioned before compliance schedule is an off-ramp to complying with uh, particular requirements like the water quality based effluent limits. If you have one of those, it'll show up in Schedule C and sort of list out essentially a schedule that says, here are the things you need to do over a period of time in order to come into compliance with the limits of your permit. It's a shield from a regulatory enforcement activity. Um, if you don't have a compliance schedule, it won't show up. But if you have one, it's going to be in this section of the permit. And then there's a whole bunch of special conditions that apply to permits. These are mostly consistent. Um, but they vary from permit to permit. Um, it's where we it's where we get things like our our annual inflow and infiltration reports that we have to send to the state and let them know what we and our satellite collection systems are doing about I and I. Uh, inspecting your outfalls will show up here. Any any sort of analyses on your mixing zone, if you have one, they'll say you have to do a mixing zone study uh, in this permit term industrial user surveys, and again, any sort of planning documents that you need to prepare um, recycled water, biosolids, uh, emergency response planning is a requirement of the permit. And so we have to do that as well. And that'll show up in Schedule D. Schedule E is all about pretreatment. Again, these are all industrial wastewater discharge requirements, but um, these are mostly federal requirements. They don't really come from state statute, but uh, this is where our pretreatment program comes from and you'll find out about it there. And then just general conditions that are in all NPDES permits, um, things like when you have to report to DEQ, um, what sort of records management, records retention you need to have, do you need to train your operators, do they need to have certifications, um, things like that you'll, all, you'll find in our general conditions. And I'd already mentioned this before, we have a lot of plans that are associated with our permits um, and these continually need to be developed and updated and approved by DEQ. So we really get a lot of work out of that requirement as well. Stormwater is very similar. It's the same permitting program. Uh, and it's, 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 an, it's an NPDES permit that is issued by DEQ to us. Background and most of the folks on, on, the, on the call know this. Um, stormwater runoff comes from impervious surfaces, roads, parking lots, sidewalks, where the road, where, where runoff uh, where there is runoff and it is collected, and that's important, if it's collected by a municipal system and conveyed somewhere in discharge, that discharge is covered by uh, the Clean Water Act. If it's not collected and it just runs off all over the place, different law, <laughs> if there is one that applies, and it generally doesn't apply to agricultural runoff. Um, the, as I said, the 1987 amendments of the Clean Water Act were really the, or the origin of um, municipal stormwater systems being covered by NPDES permits that really in the early 1990s is when the federal and state governments got going on issuing permits. Um, and in the mid 90s was the first implementation or phase one of municipal stormwater permitting in the state where these six permit areas um, listed on the screen were issued permits. And it includes Clackamas County and all of the Clackamas County co-permittees were all are all on the same individual permit. Um, the other ones are Gresham, Eugene, Salem, Portland, and Clean Water Services in Washington County. They're the only phase one permits in the state outside of ODOT. Um, the first permit term, as I said before, was in the mid 90s to the 2000s. We had a second permit term, supposed to be every five years, but DEQ gets behind some time. Sometimes um, second permit term was 04 to 9, and then 2012 to 17, and then you see a gap from 17 to 21. That was 
an administratively extended permit, but our current permit is the 21 to 26 permit. And they get issued every five years and we get more stuff to do. Um, one of the significant requirements of being covered under a permit and the thing, well, an important thing to understand about municipal stormwater permitting is, permitting is there aren't effluent limits on discharges. There are thousands of outfalls from that system throughout our service area, throughout urban Clackamas County. It's impossible to, to be able to do the intensive monitoring and reporting for thousands of outfalls. Um, so fortunately, we don't have to do that. What we do have to do is implement best management practices to reduce the impact of those discharges on receiving waters. And so permittees are required to develop stormwater management plans um, that have categories of best management practices that we implement uh, in order to demonstrate a compliance with that permit to the state. Um, and those BMPs, again, are to reduce the discharge of pollutants to the maximum extent practicable. It's a legal term. Um, and again, overall, to reduce the discharge of those pollutants, um, uh, re reduce the impact of those discharges on receiving waters. And it's not just water quality. It's not just pollution. It's also the amount of water. Um, and that's been established in the courts that the Clean Water Act applies to um, the degradation of water waterways and and, and maintaining beneficial uses. And so the amount of water is regulated as well because it uh, discharges from storm systems can impact streams and, and designated uses. Just running through a couple of these, um, these categories of BMPs, we have to do public education and public involvement, um, communicate per what message to what audience to change what behavior. We're really trying to make sure we minimize the amount of pollution that's, that is, gets into our system and leaves our system. Fairly straightforward. We have to have programs to um, respond to water quality complaints and to eliminate illicit discharges. So if somebody dumps a can of paint in a storm drain or or worse, you know, connects a sanitary system to the stormwater system, we have to have the authority to, to eliminate that connection and eliminate that discharge um, and to be able to respond to spills. And then also, uh, there's requirements in here for us to go out and look for these actively, which is an important part of the program. Construction runoff controls are required, meaning you have to have an erosion control program and you have to issue erosion control permits uh, under your permit, um, really to, to reduce the discharge of sediment and other things from construction activities. We have to have requirements um, for new development and redevelopment. So we have to have design standards that comply with the performance that the state determines in the permit, um, that, so design standards that apply to development projects for stormwater management. People have to build for stormwater that they collect. They have to build treatment works to remove things like rain gardens, not treatment plants, but um, treatment systems to remove pollution and, and also uh, control the, the volume and rate of runoff. So you have to do that. Um, we have to take care of our own stuff. That's essentially what this section says. So we have to maintain our own public infrastructure and our stormwater facilities, and we have to reduce um, the amount of pollution that's discharged from publicly owned things like streets, um, maintenance yards, uh, any industrial activity that a municipality runs. You have to have a, a, a program to reduce pollution from that. And then lastly, industrial and commercial facilities, we have to have programs to um, inspect the private stormwater systems and sources, potential sources of pollution on industrial and commercial sites and reduce those pollution discharges as well. Um, I'll mention two other programs that are outside of our municipal stormwater permit because they raise questions. If you have an industrial site that is not discharged to our system or qualifies, uh, Per some criteria by DEQ, you have to have your own industrial stormwater permit issued to you. Um, some agencies are agents of the state and will uh, issue and, and enforce those permits within their jurisdiction. It's called the 1200Z program. WES is not an agent of the state. Um, Eugene is, or Clean Water Services, for example. Um, so we, we implement our own industrial commercial stormwater program, but the state implements the industrial stormwater program for sites in our jurisdiction. And then another one is separate and dual authority that the state has for construction 
runoff control and let's call the 1200C program. So when sites get large enough and, and erosion control gets fairly complex and more impactful, the state will issue a permit to construction sites in our jurisdiction and we will implement, oh, we will issue a permit as well. So the 1200Z and 1200C programs of the state for industri industrial stormwater and construction stormwater are important things to keep in mind because they're out there that play uh, in our area. The, the the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, it was discharges to ground. And so as I had said before, and I think one of the questions, I don't know if we had it or if it was a draft question, we were going to say, does the Clean Water Act only apply to surface water or does it include groundwater? The Clean Water Act only applies to surface water. There are other uh, regulations that apply or laws that apply to groundwater. But in the state of Oregon, um, if you have an, an underground injection control, I'll talk about what that is in a minute, uh, then you have to have a permit potentially to cover that. Um, this is really driven by the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's not driven by the Clean Water Act. Um, if you have an underground injection control, which is really, um, it's called the UIC, it basically collects stormwater runoff from streets, sidewalks, parking lot, um, maybe treats it, maybe not, and then discharges it below the ground. Not to the groundwater, but below the ground rather than to a, a receiving water. Uh, we typically call these dry wells, if you've heard the term dry well. So dry wells are not covered by our municipal stormwater permit. They're covered by uh, a, a water pollution control facility permit that the state of Oregon issues. Um, and they, they, this lists some some options for compliance. Exemption would really be if you have a dry well from a certain source like roof runoff, you don't need a permit for it. If you have a dry well that's rural authorized, and rural authorized is, is a term um, that where that DEQ uses where you would submit to them to, uh, a report that says, I have, you know, I've registered my dry wells, they've been reviewed. Here's, here's why we don't think that they have a detrimental impact on water quality. And if DEQ agrees with you, then, then they'll say, well, those are rule authorized and you don't have to have a permit. But if you have a bunch of dry wells like we do in, in, our, in our partner cities and the county that we work with, where we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dry wells, you can't get them all rule authorized. So we have to have a permit issued by the state um, that's called the Water Pollution Control Facilities Permit. Uh, and it, it's very similar to a stormwater permit in and that it, we have to do particular activities and a little bit of monitoring to show we're, we're complying with um, the terms of that permit. Um, Oregon is 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 one of a few states that relies heavily on UICs. You have to have the groundwater depth and the soils and the infiltration to be able to manage stormwater in this way. Um, we're one of five states that require sampling uh, to, for discharges to underground injection controls, and we're the only state that requires permits for underground injection controls. And we do have, West has a, a water pollution control facilities permit um, that's issued to us because we have over 50 UICs. Here are the requirements. We have to do assessments and monitoring of those injection controls. O&M of, uh, of the facilities that discharge to the ground, spill prevention, good housekeeping. This sounds very similar to municipal stormwater. It's intended to be that way. But again, you're you're focusing on safe drinking water compliance, not Clean Water Act, and that's a third important part of of our regulatory construct. Um, so, what's on the horizon for us? How does that all come into play? I mean, I again, I have to emphasize we do this every day. We comply with our permits on a daily basis. We do a ton of monitoring and reporting. It really drives what we do. What is in our permits? So on the horizon, you're constantly looking out for your next permit. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about the next permit that we're going to get. We just finished up a year long review uh, and reissuance of our Tri-City permit for our Tri-City facility. It was just issued a few weeks ago. Um, Kellogg is coming up. Kellogg Creek in Milwaukee is, is coming up next year and we'll need to get that permit renewed. And then Boring and Hoodland are up soon after that. So um, new permits are on the horizon. Um, there's also uh, a lot of this continually regulatory policy and work going on at the state and federal level. Right now, Oregon DEQ is updating all of their temperature TMDLs. So again, a total maximum daily load determines how much the pollutant load that a water body can receive and, and support its designated 
uses. Um, Oregon had temperature TMDLs for all of the major basins uh, in the state, and those were invalidated through a lawsuit and by the court that said they needed to be redone. Um, and so DEQ is currently going back through those analyses and redetermining what thermal loads or temperature loads water bodies can meet, um, and that will impact us. We will likely get I can't see I can't see an outcome where we get a higher load uh, allocated to us for for heat. Uh, very likely we're going to get uh, lower loads allowed, and that will impact our permits. So we're keeping an eye on that. Actively involved in that effort. Unregulated contaminants. If you saw our last lunch and learn, is there a challenge because of they're unregulated? And we talk about PFAS a lot, for example, and we hear about PFAS. A lot, for example, but we have no requirements that we need to comply with from the federal or state governments around PFAS. They're not in our permits. We don't have limits for them. We don't have to do monitoring for them yet. And there's no TMDLs or water quality based limits that have been set. So we we are actively engaged uh, looking out on the horizon for PFAS, microplastics, phthalates, um, other things that uh, that that the EPA in particular is currently working on to develop some criteria that standards and effluent limits can be based on. Wet weather treatment capacity is a national conversation about what standards you really need to meet and what you need to do for these very infrequent high flows that you see a handful of days a year. Um, we'll talk more about that later because that'll be significant for WES and the implementation of our LAM facilities plan. But keep keep that in mind. Um, nutrients are something that we're concerned about as well. There's There are uh, permits in other parts of the country that include limitations on permits. And the first one that we've seen in Oregon in the last few years, which is out of Medford, who has nutrient limits in their permit now uh, for discharges to the Rogue River. Um, we don't know if DEQ is going to head down this path in the near future, but if they do, that'll impact us. And then environmental justice is something we're keeping track of and we hear a lot more about um, that could impact us through regulations for things we need to do um, for underserved and underrepresented communities that are disproportionately impacted by pollution from um, systems like ours. And how does all this land? I mean, how do we adjust to these things out on the horizon that we're tracking? Well, new regulations that come through our permits will impact what we build. Uh, they'll impact what we put in our Willamette facilities plan and our master plan. That will impact our capital plan. We we don't, for example, uh, and Jeff doesn't, in even in our long-term capital plan, have PFAS treatment systems in the plan. It doesn't make any sense for us right now to plan and budget for those and adjust our long-range financial strategy for things that we don't know are coming, and we're not even really sure what that's going to look like. Um, if, if we can reasonably assume that they're coming, then we can start planning for it. But uh, some of these things are pretty far out there, but they will impact what we build. They impact how we operate. Whenever we get a new stormwater permit, we have to rewrite our implementation plan. So we have to rewrite that stormwater management plan to adjust. That'll impact our strategic plan and our, our, our goals and objectives we're trying to meet. And they may impact what we have to put forth in our own district rules and regulations around development, around development standards, or even customer assistance and affordability. Again, a lot of conversations going on right now at the national level about environmental justice and affordability, and we might be required um, to do some things. So that's how the regulations impact us. So let's recap what we heard. Uh, the Clean Water Act drives our day-to-day -day lives. It's not the only thing. Uh, there's more that we have to monitor or that we have to keep track of, but really the Clean Water Act is the driver NPDES is king, meaning it is our main focus. We have other types of permits, um, but the NPDES permits really drive everything that we do, um, and they're very complex. There's a lot of moving parts as we went through all those schedules. Um, our effluent limits in our permits um, are really what drives what we put at our treatment plants. They're performance-based, um, so as those, as those show up, we really need to um, focus on those. But in the stormwater world, it's best management practices that uh, drive what's in our permits. Uh, I can't reinforce. I can't. I can't reiterate enough that we live in a world of monitoring and self-reporting. Um, our it, accuracy and integrity is very important to us, uh, and that's it. 
it's just it, it, it's really important to keep that in mind um, and that there are challenges ahead. There are things on the horizon, um, but we are actively working on those and feel ready. So questions? That was fantastic and an excellent presentation, Ron. Um, had a question in regards to PFAS because um, you talked about that uh, at the last Lunch and Learn. It was such a vast uh, topic. And knowing that PF PFAS regulations are one of the on the horizon items, yeah. um, what would that look like for us? Well, you think? Yeah, simply and quickly, you know, uh, the, one of the first steps the EPA needed to take was to set drinking water standards or drinking water requirements for PFAS. And they just did that. Um, they set maximum contaminant levels. Um, those are really low for drinking water. Not surprisingly, um, we could, they will they will take a few more steps to to build um, water quality criteria next for aquatic life and human health. Um, and that's that's how effluent limits will be derived from those criteria. Um, there, there will be some technology based effluent limits, I'm sure, for industrial wastewater discharges, but how those land in our permits, uh, they'll have to go through all those processes before we can get a number that we need gotcha. to meet. And that number is going to be very, very small. Um, we are almost, <laughs> it, it might even be below detection. That happens. Oh. That's, that's what mercury looks like. Mercury, or mercury limits are practically below detection. And so um, those rules show up differently in our permits than numeric limits, but we'll have to see. Sounds good. And then that, there was one more question, if we can answer it quickly, uh, Ron, a question that may be helpful. What is the difference between a rule and a law? Yeah, well, I mean, at the state level, I mean, laws are passed by our legislature. They, I, I generally say the laws tell you what to do and the rules tell you how you're going to do it. Um, the, uh, the, the laws come from the legislature and then the, the agencies like DEQ uh, promulgate rules to implement those laws, which are approved by the EQC and others and the department director of DEQ, but um, both matter, both apply. We have to comply with both laws and rules. One doesn't replace the other. All right. Well, thank you, Ron. We are out of time. Thank you everyone who was able to make this. Um, uh, we always wanna hear feedback. So if, if you're liking these, if, if these are helpful, uh, please let us know if you've got suggestions of how to improve, if you've got ideas for future topics. So 2025 is open. Uh, please let us know. Uh, email Chris um, or Ron or myself, and, and we can get those ideas and, and, and figure out how to include, include those. Um, I think I think that's a wrap. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you, Ron. Very good presentation. Thank you.